The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the third chapter. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. When I was first asked to give the message today, I had a sermon already worked out in my head. <laughs> I, I knew what I was going to talk about. But after studying the readings for today, that sermon flew right out the window. <laughs> How could I pass up the chance to preach about the fall of Adam and Eve? It's a classic. It's the story of our lives, each one of us. We have all had our own fall at times. Some of us who are uh, slow learners, maybe even more than once. We've each felt uh, the curses, and, and they, they weren't in today's Old Testament reading, so I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 3 and read verses 17 through 19. And I think any of you that are also farmers like myself will find these applicable. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now any of you that have seen some of my pastures, <laughs> you know that the ground does bring forth thorns and thistles. And you can ask my son Aaron, who just this past week, uh, armed with a corn knife, whacked a few of those cursed thistles. But while preparing this message, I came across a devotional that related a few of the thoughts on today's Old Testament reading. And it is titled, I Was Afraid. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. The verb which is translated walking in the garden means to circulate about and is often used in the context of judgment at the time of the evening breeze. For no good reason, the King James Version translated this as in the cool of the day. This mistranslation gives the impression that God was out for a nice evening stroll and just happened to bump into Adam and Eve. In fact, the Hebrew wording of the text indicates that God came in a windstorm to confront Adam and Eve regarding their transgression. 
This is why the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Their efforts to hide from the Lord were akin to a toddler hiding from an adult. But the Lord let them think that he couldn't see them and called out, Where are you? Adam replied, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. And then almost as an afterthought, he added, Because I was naked. Out of fear, Adam admitted hiding himself. God knows the answer, as he always does, but he wanted to hear Adam confess his sin. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Adam, showing his newly broken humanity, plays the blame game. First he blames God by saying, The woman you gave to be with me. In other words, he is claiming that if God had never given him this woman, none of this would have ever happened. Then he blames Eve. She gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. So the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? Joining Adam in the blame game, she said, The serpent tricked me and I ate. The serpent shows himself to be the world's first politician. <laughs> by inventing the half-truth. He said, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This much was true, but he neglected to mention that they would be powerless to always choose good. A couple of thoughts from this devotional. When we confess our sins, it's not like we're telling God something He doesn't already know. After all, He knows us better than we know ourselves. We confess to remind ourselves of our need for a Savior. In, in our old confession of sin that we used to use, I'm kind of old-fashioned, the, the words came right out of 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You guys probably remember that one, know it by, by heart almost. Anyway, God, really what God just wants us to do is to admit that we need Him. And a second thought from the devotional has to do with the serpent slash Satan and his half-truths. Most of us have no trouble avoiding the nasty, full-throttle, 100% sins. Murder, rape, stealing. But the devil's half-truths are what catch us. Like, for instance, what could be wrong with working long hours and ignoring my family? After all, I'm doing it for them. Or, of course it's okay to yell at the referee. After all, he made a horrible call. Or, <clears throat> surely it's okay to skip church in order to work this morning because with the extra money I make, I can give more to the church. And I could go on because I'm not even half done with the half-truth sins that plague me. And if I were to open it up to our congregation here today, I'm sure that we might be here a while. And I know how you all love long sermons. So, <laughs> so. The, the main point is our enemy always dresses up the sin with just enough good to deceive us. And you know where he does some of his best deceiving? Right here in the church. We can get an inflated view of ourselves when we are doing a, quote, good work for the Lord. But if we are too full of ourselves, we don't leave much room for Jesus to work, and we surely don't leave room for others in the church to work. One test for determining if uh, we're doing our good work for the right reasons would be, would it, it would be if we, would we do that good work if nobody knew about it? And I might read from uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. 
It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. It starts with verse 1 of chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. But what can we say about today's gospel lesson? Over the centuries, these verses in Mark chapter 3 have caused more than a little confusion. And to help explain these verses, I want to read from uh, another devotional that I found. And it's entitled, The Unforgiven, Excuse Me, The Unforgivable Sin. And it starts right where our reading started today. This follows Jesus appointing the twelve. Then he went home and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. We use a different word than what uh, our gospel lesson today said. But this restrain means to use force. And this is no gentle intervention. They are planning on taking Jesus by force. This is because people were saying he has gone out of his mind. Now the scribes came from Jerusalem to investigate Jesus for the temple authorities. Their investigation was pretty much a joke because after taking one look, they boldly pronounced their judgment. He has Beelzebul. This name is a corruption of the ancient Philistines, Baal. It literally means God of the dung. They claim this is why he casts out demons. Their logic is flawed, not because Satan couldn't pretend to be good, and we know from uh, 2 Corinthians that Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light, but because they failed to see Jesus for who he truly is. In response, Jesus point out, pointed out the hole in their logic. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. Here Jesus makes one of his most misunderstood statements. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Over the centuries, misguided people have said all kinds of nonsense about this phrase. Perhaps the simplest I have heard is, if you don't know what it is, you've never done it. What nonsense. People commit sins they are unaware of all the time. The most destructive misunderstanding of this statement is the teaching that the sin against the Holy Spirit is despair. This teaching has caused no end of harm over the centuries, causing people in need of God's grace to fall deeper and deeper into despair. If there's one thing God can rescue us from, it is despair. The right answer is, is presented right in the text. They had said he has an unclean spirit. So calling the Spirit of God evil is the sin against the Holy Spirit. The reason it is unforgivable is because it is a rejection of the only one who brings forgiveness. And it is said, it's rather that if you decide firmly that the doctor who is offering to perform a life-saving operation on you is in fact a sadistic murderer, you will never give your consent to the operation. So when we, when we, to understand the, the whole unforgivable sin uh, uh, claim, it's because the only reason it's unforgivable is because you've rejected the Savior from the very beginning and said, and, and the scribes in this case were saying, he's, he's not only not the Savior, he's the devil. And so that is the unforgivable sin. And throughout the Gospels, 
not just this one, but all through, Jesus is constantly preaching to the self-righteous leaders. In this gospel lesson today, the scribes are so full of themselves that they cannot recognize the Holy Spirit working in Jesus. They claim he is of the devil, Beelzebul, Baal, or whatever evil spirit pops into their head. Today, we still have self-righteous religious leaders who become so self-absorbed that they cannot recognize God's Holy Spirit. They, or should I say we, substitute half-truths for the whole truth. We want a soft, pliable God who is not too hard on us. One that has a, just a few easy-to-follow rules. That way we don't have to admit we are sinners. Which takes us right back to 1 John. If we say we have no sin, then you know the whole rest of the story. Yeah. Which ultimately takes us right back to the garden. Adam and Eve, the snake, and our desire to be our own God. But the good news is right in plain sight in today's gospel. And I want to read uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 28, because it puts it real plain. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. And that's, in this Bible anyway, that's written in red. Those are words that Jesus said. He said, all sins. So it doesn't matter what any of us have done. Doesn't matter what blasphemies you've uttered, as long as you know that Jesus is the source of our salvation. We have a clean slate. So, today, when we leave here, we know we have a clean slate. So let's go out and live that way. Thank you.